I tell you what, man, if you stop drawing comics for too long, you lose your you lose your wrist action. You know, it's a bit like a boxer losing his form and then he tries to come back. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Guest of honor today, the great Brendan McCarthy. You liked Mad Max Fury Road, so did we. Brendan McCarthy is responsible for half the visuals and co-writing that son bitch. What other comics, man? Freak Wave, Skin. Part of the original British invasion in comics in the 80s. Part of the creator-owned movement in comics in the 80s that, that probably started at places like Pacific Comics and went on to Eclipse and really influenced an entire generation uh, through that work. Brendan McCarthy, God damn it. Thanks for coming by. Oh, it's great. Um, I, I've, uh, I only recently found your uh, uh, YouTube channel, you know, about few, a few months ago. I spotted, it just appeared on my YouTube one day with uh, something about Dave Gibbons, an interview with Dave Gibbons. I watched that and then I started to watch other stuff. And I just think it's, uh, it's uh, to me, it's the best comic channel out at the moment in terms of podcasts and stuff. It just feels, feels the most Joe Rogan-y. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You do have excellent taste. Uh, before we really begin, uh, where are you broadcasting out of? Are you uh, UK, Ireland? I'm in Ireland. Yeah, I'm in the west of Ireland. Okay. Uh, uh, my 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 parents are from Ireland, and also I was sort of spent a lot of time in Ireland when I was a kid. So I'm very comfortable here. I I know the culture very well, and um, I came over here basically to uh, look after my elderly mother for uh, uh, and um, you know just um, got into living here again and. Um, you know, I do miss London and L.A. and Hollywood. It was quite weird to go from Hollywood Boulevard to fields full of cows. That was quite a strange culture shock. But, good, place uh, to, good place to be right at this very minute. Actually, look- this is, yeah, it, it's, I mean, really, my life isn't that different with, this, with the lockdown and stuff. It's because uh, I tend to be indoors drawing again most of the time. And uh, it's just like a Sunday, really, just a row of Sundays. All the shops are shut except for a few things, you know, just... It'll, it'll pass, won't it? Brendan, one question I always wanted to ask you, because it's very hard for me to deconstruct your artwork. Uh, it's so original. Uh, can you name a handful of influences uh, outside of comics that you might have brought to your work? Well, yes. I mean, um, I mean, comics is the foundational visual influence on me. You know, as a kid, I, was very inter- I liked reading comics or to be more specific, I like looking at comics. And um, uh, so you got to remember, I grew up in the 60s, so I was actually buying, you know, Ditko Spider-Mans off the rack and reading them, you know. I, I vividly recall buying the episode with the looter on the front as he was getting towards the end of his run. Um, but, um, you know, other than the sort of fundamental influence of comics, British comics and American comics, and then later French, you know, European. Um, um, I did study fine art at college, at university. I went to Chelsea School of Art and did four years in fine art. So really the exposure to um, the canon of uh, fine art, mainly, you know, modernism is, uh, and the it's essentially it's about the ideas in the art that appeal to me. I was... Uh, you know, sort of interesting conceptual art when I was a student. Uh, but if you think of, um, say, the Dardaists and collage, for example, that's a big influence in my work. I was, I liked the 60s pop artists and uh, particularly the 60s work of David Hockney, uh, I liked a lot. Uh, it, he was a really interesting character. He was a very big uh, influence on me when I was a teenager. He was... Um, a very strong, you know, individual when he came out, quite radical at the time. Um, you know, an openly gay man. He was also uh, a vegetarian, a conscientious objector. And uh, he, uh, you know, he he supported kind of countercultural stuff like Oz magazine and uh, things like that. So he, he was a big influence on me, how he drew and the sort of uh, uh, kind of that sort of mock naive style he would adopt in his early work. I like the Britishness of it. Um, uh, so a lot of those pop artists like Andy Warhol was a big influence philosophically as well as visually. And you can see Warhol's influence went into Jamie Reed's work. And Jamie Reed is the guy who designed all the Sex Pistols uh, imagery, you know, the queen with the 
it's torn imagery over her, and all, you know, all that stuff, the Jamie Reed Sex Pistol uh, iconography. So that very fuzzy black and white Xerox look with flat colours plastered on it was a big influence on me. So Jamie Reed, I'd say, as a development, I'm from Warhol. And also when you're exposed to modernism in painting, you've got to look at people like Matisse and the Fauvists, uh, where their use of colour, they actually start to break down colour as sort of something that fills in black lines and became colour as a way of showing you form, but through colour rather than through line work. And it's something that I've started to become a bit more um, proactive about in how I'm doing my comics at the moment, uh, where I'm really letting the colorists off the leash and really want them to do their thing. And, and uh, I can see that as a new trend uh, coming in comics, is that the superstar colorist will become uh, highly sought after. I probably won't be able to get the guy who does my stuff at the moment, Leno Grady, fantastic colorist, and uh, I'm sure he'll uh, be in hot demand, you know. So that's a, a little popery of stuff. I mean, I'd say surrealists, uh, not so much Dali, even though I've come to reconsider Dali now, because uh, when you get college, Dali was very uncool because he'd become too uh, ubiquitous. But um, Max Ernst was a real uh, influence on me as well. His surrealism is fantastic. I mean, he's done so many well-known paintings. It's unreal. He's the great surrealist painter, I think. Um, and then, of course, influence of film, um, Yellow Submarine, uh, the the actual design by Heinz Eidelman of Yellow Submarine, I thought was just fantastic. I've never seen a film like it before or since, and it has mesmerized me ever since. I still look at it now. I watch a clip on YouTube and scratch my head thinking they did that in a year for a million quid. <laughs> and uh, it's absolutely stunning. And um, Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, was a huge influence on me as well. It kind of, uh, I'd never been as thrilled and immersed in a film as that, which I just walked in off the street and watched. You know, I didn't really have any expectations, and it it completely blew me away and, you know, knocked me sideways. And uh, that was the, before that, 2001 A Space Odyssey had been a big obsession. I'd seen that about 20 times in the cinema. And it was the first film I bought a book on, on the making of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was a famous book that came out in the 70s. And uh, it was the first time I started to understand how films were made. And uh, that kind of interested me. So I ended up doing film and painting at college. So, and I, I think overall the biggest influence of everything is music. I was a huge, uh, I grew up as a kid in the 60s. So I was, I, I now realize I lived through a golden age of music for about 40 years. Like the 60s, just, I can remember Beatles singles coming out and hearing them on the radio, you know like hello, goodbye and stuff like that, you know, just out. And um, when the uh, 70s came along, then you had glam rock with Mark Boland, then David Bowie, then the early Eno Roxy Musics, then Lou Reed and the discovery of Velvet Underground, and then that gave rise to punk rock and that massive explosion in the 70s. Then there was, you know, New Wave, Talking Heads and all the New York scene, television, people like that. And uh, then the Smiths, the kind of, brilliant uh, arch kind of aspect of, the, of that music and um, and then I guess the last hurrah was the sort of Oasis the you know the first two Oasis records and Blur you know all that Britpop Manchester dance acid house thing 90s kind of stuff really isn't it and um, that sort of run from the 60s through to the 90s in music was massively influential to me and influenced how I think about loads of stuff so there you go that's a bit to get in on with yeah, I feel like that that uh, invites a lot of questions for follow up. I, I'm going to say there, there's a lot I want to come back to there, Brandon. But the the thing I would start with is how do you transition from art school into the comics field? Like, was that always the plan? What was the comic scene like? Um, how do you how do you make that transition? Yeah, well, so we're talking about the mid '70s when I'm at college, and I'm doing comic book based paintings. I'm doing giant, massive you know, eight foot by 10 foot paintings of Batman covers, uh, you know, uh, those beautiful 60s Infantino Batman covers. I thought, I think it's some of the most sublime covers ever. Uh, the house the Joker built is probably my favorite comic book cover, which is a Carmine Infantino Batman cover. Um, so um, I was doing these very comic book paintings or media-based paintings. I was, for example, 
for the first time since the 60s, a TV station in England repeated The Prisoner, the Patrick McGowan uh, TV series, which I remember watching as a kid. And it just stayed in my mind like a kind of crazy dream where you think, did I really, was there really a TV series where there was these giant white balls and <laughs> Sky couldn't get out of it? it was, did I dream it or did that really happen? And um, when it came on, I, I would take photographs of the television screen. And then I did um, uh, a series of about 100 paintings about sort of that big or stacked together or just different shots of the prisoner, which I would... Um, transfer onto the canvas by uh, a t-shirt used for making t-shirts um, where you would iron on the the uh, thing and it would come out in reverse on the uh, on the t-shirt so you had to make sure you did it the right way around <laughs> and um, so I did a whole load of prisoner paintings by ironing the images on I get them transferred in a print shop onto this paper and then I could put them onto canvases and um, I was doing a lot of media stuff like that uh, but at the same time, I did. I was also doing uh, uh, because the punk thing was happening. Then there was a lot of fanzines about. And Brett Ewins, who uh, I'd known since I was a kid, we were both sort of into comics, and that's that sort of bonded us. And um, he went to art college too. He was interested in some very similar sort of stuff. You know, William Burroughs and you know the Hunter S. Thompson. You know all that stuff you were into around that age of your life. And um, um, so I was doing comic strips but quite sort of um you know punk with tear up bits on them and stuff like that they were kind of punk comics and um i did want to actually do a comic strip though and actually be in the real world be published to be published was the thing i wanted and uh, so um back in those days music was a huge cultural influence like it's not so much now it's always faded away really but um, at the time, it was just in everything. It was all around us. You'd hear it all the time, everywhere, and it made a difference, you know. So things like the Sex Pistols upended British society, no end, and it was great fun. It was really wonderful to see everybody running around with their heads on fire. And um, uh, so, so in all, because of the interest in music, there were a lot of music papers. Uh, so um, these are magazines that came out every week and uh, it, some of them had comic strips in and I read the comic strips and then one week I noticed that the comic strip wasn't in it and it had, but then it wasn't in it next week. I thought it must be over. So why don't I pitch them a punk rock strip? So I pitched a punk rock strip to this magazine called Sounds. Uh, you know, I just put a letter together, said the editor sounds on the envelope, sent it off. Think, I, you know, I didn't know what would happen. And uh, they gave me a call and said, yeah, we like this. Do you want to, when, when can you start? You know? So uh, that was, that was, I got, I was writing and drawing a, a comic strip called The Electric Hoax. It went into this slot in Sounds magazine. And uh, interesting enough, there was another guy obviously keeping his eye on what was happening in the culture. Because when I stopped doing that Electric Hoax strip, by then Pete Milligan, I got Pete Milligan involved to write it because I felt my writing you know, it was taking me so long. It was taking longer than the art. That got Pete in. He was obviously a better writer than I was. And that's how that partnership formed. But uh, funny enough, after we, we ended the strip, Alan Moore got in there with his first published strip called um, Stars My Degradation. So it, there's all these interesting little connections in the early days of comics because nothing was happening in British comics at all. There was very little happening because um, the 60s underground stuff had, sort of petered out really i mean you would still pick up i think there's a british ver uh, an anthology of underground comics called nasty tales which reprinted fabulous furry free brothers robert crumb uh but that was about it really that 60s underground stuff had dwindled and um so uh i also put out my own comic with brett ewins called sometimes stories which was wasn't underground comic but it wasn't a mainstream comic. It was, if you like, proto-vertigo indie comic. You know, it was that kind of sensibility. And um, so they were, they were my first two published things. And uh, really, there wasn't much happening uh, in British comics. Just knackered out old um, 60s underground, the, 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 the sort of tail end of that stuff, really. And then um, t when 2000 AD appeared, I remember being in a newsagent. Uh, in Britain and just scanning the comics just to see what was there and so what's this one in 2000 AD I looked at the first one I didn't buy that number one 
but on the sec- second week it came out, I saw on the back they had something called Judge Dredd. And uh, I was on my way around to see Brett Ewan. So I, I went around and said, have you seen this stuff, Brett? And uh, he looked at that and said, no, this is all right, isn't it? And said, yeah, I know. It's almost like there's something going on here. So we started buying 2000 AD, like lots of people did. All the freaks and weirdos of England started immediately zooming in on it. And then within a short time, it was like, how do we get into 2000 AD? How can we get anything published? And again, that was a question of, I just phoned up the editor and managed to get through to <coughs> the Kelvin Gosnell, who was the editor of 2000 AD at the time. And uh, he said, send us in some stuff. We're looking for cover ideas. So do us a couple of sketches or some covers. So uh, uh, me and Brett knocked up some cover ideas, sent them in, and they we sent about six in, and they picked two. So we suddenly had a commission for two covers. And in those days, we both used to work on this, our, our artwork together because Brett was good at some things and I was better at other things. Like he, Brett was good at feet and I was crap at feet. <laughs> so, so Brett would draw the feet in the drawing and I'd draw, you know, Bernie Wrights and type hands or something, you know. So it was a strange how we used to work on the same artwork together. Um, but uh, that's that was how it sort of started off. And you got to remember there just was nothing there. I mean... What's a bit infuriating is that people now just assume this industry's been here all the time, you know, graphic novels and, you know, creator rights and all that stuff. And uh, we're the people that set all that stuff up because there was nothing before. You know, there was the underground stuff a bit. And uh, that was about it. Brandon, you mentioned creator rights. Uh, That was something I have a specific note about that I came across somewhere, an interview with you somewhere about owning your own work. And that's pretty forward thinking. I think this is early 80s, you know, the the work that you own. And I'm thinking of it from like Pacific and Eclipse time period. Um, yeah. What put those ideas like, like, how do you come up with that stuff? Is that something you pulled in from music? Or is that what cartoonists were talking about around you? I'm somebody who's very independent. You know, I'm a very, very independent person, independent thinker, independent how I live my life. And I hate control freaks. And I hate people telling me what to do, which is why... <laughs> you know, you become an artist and you lead a wacko life, you know. But um, so the idea that I would invent something and then somebody would tell me what I can do with my own creation was too much for me. So uh, that was just par for the course. That was that had, that was a given that I would own my own stuff, you know. And at that time, I'm working with Pete Milligan. So the two of us were the co-owners of uh, everything we came up with in that hot streak in the 80s. So from... Uh, we owned the Electric Hoax. We owned um, uh, Strange Days. We owned uh, Rogan Gosh. We owned Skin. Uh, I've subsequently gone on to own Dream Gang. Uh, but now and then, strategically, I will give one to, to a publisher that I know they're going to own it because I want to get something out. It, it, I, for example, I created something called The Zorcer of Zilk, specifically for 2000 AD. They were saying, you know, we'd like you to do something for us. And I said, okay, how about a bit of lunacy, something a bit that isn't dystopian sci-fi, which is their sort of stock in trade. They said, yeah, we'd like a bit of that old Brenda McCarthy style psychedelic stuff. And I said, great. So I came up with the Sorcerer Zilk. They put me in touch with Al Ewing to develop it. And Al was an upcoming writer then. He's now become quite a big writer in comics, which is great for him. And um, that was one where I thought, well, they're going to own this. 2008, don't do it, create a rights. I thought, but I don't mind because I, my desire to get something wacko out through 2000 AD and into British news agents was a strategic decision. I thought I'd rather get that out and I can kiss goodbye to the source's ownership. That's okay. I've still got tons of other stuff that I own and I've got a drawer full of stuff that I haven't even made yet. So, um, uh, it's always been important to me, creator rights. I mean, you know, we've all. If I just thought, if they can fuck over Jack Kirby, then I'm I'm insignificant compared to Kirby. So what will they do to me? You know. So uh, you know, I, I had a fairly strong idea that, you know, the people in the film business or television, they're not your friends. They're there to, uh, you know, you've got to be smart. And I, I had a lawyer from quite early on, which was quite helpful. If that was an accident, uh, but. I needed a lawyer to do a deal for me on an animation thing. And then that helped a lot because then he would look at contracts and say, don't sign that. (laughs) So I'd say, okay, I won't. I mean, owning your own stuff is great, but at the same time, if you don't do anything with it, what's the point of owning it? In some ways you might be better off selling it to a a publisher who then 
puts it out, you know. I, I don't mind uh, – like, well, something I look forward to with the Zorza result, I finished the second series – and um, if they decided to do another series, I might, I might be interested. But at the same time, I think I'm, I'm kind of curious to see what would it be like under another writer-artist team. You know, that sort of interests me to see what they, how, what direction somebody else would take it in. So once I make the decision strategically to say, okay, this is owned by them, then I'm, I, you know, that's my adult decision. I'm not going to angst about it in interviews or something. This brings about some other questions because I kind of abide by exactly what you said. Uh, do mutually good business with one another if you're going to do some kind of work for hire thing. But can you just uh, explain what y your strategy was when you did some of the Marvel work? I left comics at the uh, in the early 90s when I felt the 80s sort of scene was basically over. It was done then. It was all platinum covers with embossed, you know, whatever. You know, all that thing happened, Wizard Magazine and... And I just thought, okay, this isn't my scene. My my time is done. And it just so happened that I was getting offers in the era of pop videos and later on in computer animation. And uh, that was a brand new territory for me, and it interested me and excited me. So I went off into that. So I got out of comics at the right time for me. You know, I'm just other people that stayed and thrived. You know, but uh, I I felt like I'd said what I had to say. You know, the the the, the citadel had been breached. And it was up to, you know, who comes in next to keep in and, and to see where it's going, you know. Well, what happened out of nowhere, about 15 years after leaving comics, I did a book called Swim Any Purpose, which was a, a, a small print boutique edition. I called it a visual autobiography. What I had was I had about 200 pages of unpublished work. That I thought, well, this is really interesting, this stuff. People haven't seen it before. And it's, a lot of it's art, fine, arty stuff or art, art house comics. I put that out. It got into the hands of Mark Sciarello from DC Comics, who was editing Solo Comic. And he, out of the blue, he got hold of me and asked me, would you like to do the last episode of Solo? You can do anything you like. You can use DC's characters, you know, within reason, not be obscene or anything. <laughs> but, you know, you, huge latitude and we pay well and, you know, you get to do everything right, Troy, whatever you want to do, it's yours. And he said, it's the last episode, so it doesn't matter. You can go batshit crazy and it doesn't matter. You know? So I said, how can you not turn that? How could you turn that down? You know? <laughs> That's probably the best single offer I've had in, from a comic book publisher ever. So I really enjoyed doing Solo. It was great fun. And uh, an editor at Marvel liked the Solo and got in touch with me and said, would you be interested in doing a strip for Marvel? And I'd always loved, uh, I'd always wanted to get my hands on Doctor Strange so that was my first request. He said, well, I'm editing the Spider-Man line. If you can marry the two together in a, in a story, I can sell it. I can green light it. So I thought, well, one of my favorite ever Marvel comics of the 60s is the Doctor Strange Spider-Man team up that Ditko did in an annual about 1965 or 66. It's a really beautiful – it's, it's Ditko at the height of his powers. The story's not great, but it's Ditko just effortless, effortlessly blending, you know, urban spider-man with phantasmagorical doctor strange and uh so that was my yardstick and it was purely me just saying okay i'm just going to do something for marvel i'm not going to own it they own it and uh have have some fun they left me alone i did what i wanted to do had a bit of editorial input you know just on a few bits and pieces but it was generally what uh, how i wanted to do it um i will say at that time because I was just returning to comics after a 15 year layoff, I tell you what, man, if you stop drawing comics for too long, you lose your, you lose your wrist action. You know, it's a bit like a boxer losing his form. And then he tries to come back. I've had to sort of relearn comics again on, on my way uh, back into the industry. So it's been quite interesting to redefine, you know, your style. And I mean, I don't draw as well as I used to. Uh, I, I, and also back then I was crazy in the eighties. I'd spend a week on a page, things like that. And, and lived below the poverty line for about 10 years as a result. Um, so I could never make a living from comics. And, uh, I, I just thought I can't go back to that type of lifestyle. So I worked out a different style where I, I was prepared to let less perfect images out, you know, and be a bit more forgiving. Um, but it's made it a lot easier for me. And plus obviously the big change of course is to go from analog to digital in the uh, in the production of the work and what digital allows you to do and i see um i see digital in the same way as um you know electronic music is to rock music or something if if 
the work I was doing before was more like rock music, analog. I think the digital, sort of the, the potential of digital in terms of what you can do with com- Photoshop and computers and stuff, I feel that that's influenced my work quite a lot as well now. I, I particularly like letting just, I like nice, rough, edgy synth music. You know, some of that 80s pop was really lovely, great synth stuff. And um, you can't beat a good synth riff, I think. And um, I, I feel like uh, digital works a bit like that to me. That's the right way I see it. I see the uh, art in comics as when I use digital effects in it, as a bit like using a synthesizer and those kinds of effects. So that's gone off a bit from your tan- of a tangent from the Marvel thing. But no, I didn't mind doing that for Marvel at all, to get back to your original question. Um, you know, it was a chance to do a couple of characters that I liked. It was done. I got that out of my system. And um, I did pitch them a sequel to uh, Fever, this Doctor Strange story, but they didn't, they didn't go for it. Um, but anyway, it was fun. Well, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a really, I had a really good idea for it. But I used some of the ideas in The Sorcerer's Zill. So in the end, they all come out somewhere or other. I think there's a whole generation that probably that's where they discover your art, the Solo and the Spider-Man Doctor Strange. Oh. That was stuff that I bought new, you know, like I I was sort of aware of you, but it was from back issues. You know, whenever that stuff started to appear at the comic book shop, I think a lot of us got excited. And I think a lot of people were finding your work for the first time in that, you know, in your return to comics in that second wave. Uh, You mentioned some digital stuff, Brandon, and I'm curious, I'm always curious about process. And I wonder if you could walk us through a process of, you know, creating a page of comics, what tools you're using. Are you drawing digitally, like on a tablet or... No, no. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've tried it, but what I what I realised I was doing by moving off pe- pen and paper, pencil, pe- paper, pen, ink, all that stuff, and white out lots of white out. Um, <laughs> once I moved off the analog and onto screen, I realised I was on screen all the time. I was drawing on screen. I was looking at it on screen. And when I was getting the printed thing back, I was thinking, it doesn't look as good as it did on my computer. You know, I'd be very critical of it. And I just thought, so it was a decision. I didn't want to spend all my time on screen. And so I decided I want to, I'll draw it, I'll draw, I like the, the development of my wrist action as an artist with, with pen and paper and pencil. Uh, because drawing on a, uh, a tablet changes your wrist action, you know. Uh, so... Um, uh, there's something, there's a look. I can tell when something's been drawn on Wacom and I can almost tell when something's been drawn on paper. There's a kind of, it gets a bit too clean or something. There's something, um, it's a little bit too perfect in uh, digital. So I like a bit of rough edge that the initial drawing gives me in, I'm, I'm just going to say analog, you know, pe- paper and pen. And um, so I, I, I will... Uh, when I get it, when I get a script or I write the script, I will then break a, a, the panel. First thing I do is I break the page down into thumbnails and just thumbnail, say, a sequence. Probably about six pages at a go. I don't, I don't see, I won't thumbnail an entire episode or issue. I tend to do it in sequences. I have a rough idea of pacing and where I need to be with certain things. And um, once I've got a rough idea of the storytelling and the camera angles. Um, uh, I then uh, set about drawing it, and that's the hard work. But that's the real, that's, that's the hardest bit of the comic for me is drawing it. Um, I'm not the world's greatest artist, you know, in terms of drawer. Uh, there's people like Simon Bisley and Mobius and Joe Kubert, and you know all these people that you look at and you go, okay, well I'll never be as good as those guys. But what I can bring to the table is originality and thought, and uh, what it's actually about. That sort of stuff is actually really what interests me. And um, so I'm very much an ideas man. I come from, I'm more like a Jack Kirby creator in the sense that Jack Kirby was a great font of original ideas and characters and stories. And, you know, I'm an artist who's like that, which does create a lot of problems for me if I'm working with writers sometimes where they want to control all that. And I'm thinking, why am I being shut out from the actual best bit, which is coming up with the stuff? So um, with Pete Milligan, I was lucky that we had a, we were symbiotic and we simpatico, I mean, and uh, we were, uh, you know, there wasn't any ego there, which is great. So it was just whatever's the best comic, whatever's the best idea, 
and also I, Pete was a guy you could throw him an idea uh, like skin for example and he would get it and he'd come back and he'd add have, have added to it with a script that was so dynamic that you think shit how do I justify you know how am I going to make this script you know work you know so that was great um so to get back to the process um I'm uh, once I've got it drawn I scan it into photoshop I clean it up on photoshop a bit and change any what I need is I need lots of time different steps in the process so I can keep seeing the art again new because I need to revive uh, uh, in order to spot my mistakes and badly drawn bits you know also I'm terrible on continuity so I'm the kind of guy that if somebody's holding a gun in one hand in the next panel it's in the other hand you know <laughs> so I've got to really watch continuity because I tell you what bores the crap out of me in comics is there was you know there's that phase where everybody went through talking about we want we don't we don't call them comics anymore we call them pamphlets and they're now it's sequentialism that really bored the crap out of me all that stuff when everything was about sequentialism and it was just suddenly people were it was almost like you know in animation you have this concept of the in between where you have the main shot and then there's all the in betweens that give you the action it's like everybody in comics started drawing the in between drawings between the main key action points which i thought was getting really tedious it was like you know you'd have four pages of somebody walking downstairs with some you know captions over it or something like that you know like that sort of writer centric comics and um i've always found that very tedious that comics suddenly get shoved into a you know there's a theor there's a theoretical thing dumped over comics so the more they resemble a film the more good a comic they are which i find i've always found that really tedious so i'm not filmic at all in how i approach my storytelling to comics um you know i'm aware of angles but at the same time uh i'm not that bothered about all that stuff i don't need to tell it cinematically I, you know i know that's a requis it's a requirement when you're working for people like marvel dc those kinds of people they they think what's the hell what's up with your storytelling here this doesn't you know why wasn't that a wide angle why you know what you know you know whatever and you just think well I don't want to do it that way. I just want to do it, do it through feel and intuition. Um, so there's a person. So I'm personalising the storytelling as much as I am the drawing, the character, the style, and all that stuff. So this, that storytelling in ingredients are important to me. So anyway, what, I go into Photoshop. I correct mistakes. I clean up, you know, dodgy bits of line art or whatever it is. Make sure all the blacks are nice and black and. Uh, once that's done, either I colour it myself, as in, say, Dream Gang. That was the last big one I coloured myself. It was a graphic novel with Dark Horse. Um, or I've started working with colourists whose work I notice, uh, and I say, would you be interested in colouring this? But I, what, one of the arrangements I have with the colourist is that once they coloured it, they send the work back to me before it goes to the editor. And then I, I then mess around with it and put borders in and fill the gutters with images and color and uh you know i might mix a panel differently like if the guy's colored it and i feel it's a bit lackluster i might just bump the contrast right up and suddenly the panel can come alive like that so i give it a production pass at the end just to get it nice and peachy and then it goes to the editor and uh then you get uh, a letterer if you get a good one it, that can be okay some some letterers can kill comics i think by bad placement and lettering you know that's saying that does my head in when i you know you see something come back and the letter is you know you leave space for the lettering you know, they stick it right over the guy you know and you think <laughs> anyway you can't say anything though otherwise you get an awkward you get a different you get a reputation for being difficult so you you have to be political about it and go i'm gonna have to suck this up you know you better uh, get that Ames lettering guide and start start getting those chops up. <laughs> Let, well, letter your own boards. Um, no, I mean I've been blessed with some great letterers. Like uh, the guy who's it, who's it? Is it Nate uh, from Blambot? He was really good. What's his name? He's really he's really good. Anyway, I was very happy with what he did. He was great. And I've had a couple of British letterers that are good too. Um, I um, I think it's a skill I'm probably going to have to. I've been avoiding taking control of lettering but i think it's probably something i'm going to have to do if i really want to be completely 100 percent satisfied with what comes out brendan you said uh that you you know your storytelling sensibility uh with the comic page it's not very filmic 
But I'm, yeah. I'm curious about when you develop Freak Wave after seeing uh, Mad Max number two, um, yeah. and you decide to sh come to LA to shop it around, try to make it a movie. Like, how does that whole process work? Is the comic done as a pitch to take to Hollywood? And did you live in the States for a while while you were uh, doing that work? Unlike these days, um, the idea that of a comic being turned into a film is highly fanciful. Now, almost every comic you read is a film pitch, you know, or a TV series pitch. You're reading episodic TV scripts or you're reading film scripts, you know, uh, you know as comics. So um, what I like about uh, Hollywood is hearing that some executives get coverage. You know what coverage is, where somebody gives them notes on a script. They get a script reader to read a script. And they say, we think you might like this. And they give you a couple of page synopsis of what the, the story is. So the executive doesn't have to read the script, <laughs> right, because they're so lazy and can't be asked and busy or whatever. A lot of nice beaches uh, out there in uh, Glitter Town. <laughs> your, your film is there to pay for the extension of their pool. Um, so um, back in those days, of course, nobody nobody was making anything out of comics except the odd shitty cartoon series by Nell Varner or somebody. Um, but uh, no, I was purely naive. I, I, I saved up some money and I, uh, me and Pete basically put together Freak Wave as a film. I, I persuaded I persuaded Pete to get involved with Freak Wave. You know, we wrote a really good treatment. I did loads of designs. So I had a little treatment package. And uh, I just got on a plane, went to America, arrived in Hollywood. Back, back then, I'm talking about 40 years ago, Hollywood was, was like junky central. It was like a real shithole. And um, uh, I'd never been to uh, America before. Um, and here I am in, I stayed in a really hot, cheap, I, you know, I just got the cheapest place I could get out of a guidebook. And it was like, <laughs> I mean, it was just people, it was just full of junkies and hookers. And I was sort of sitting in my uh, hotel room, petrified to go out. Welcome to the States. And, well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea of the place, but uh, anyway, I was just a, a block away from Hollywood Boulevard, which back then was really a rough place. You know, it wasn't, it's been cleaned up now. Anyway, uh, I had no idea of how, how do you get into the film uh, industry? So I, I, was, I, I just went on a whim that I would sell it. I had just ridiculous idea that I would. And um, I, uh, I remember phoning up Universal Pictures because they, I'd seen, um, no, Warner Brothers because they'd done Mad Max too and, and distributed it in America. And I said, I would like to speak to the producer of <laughs> Mad Max 2. <laughs> this woman on the phone, she says, oh, son, that, that, uh, that, that show isn't here anymore. We didn't make that. I said, well, uh, can I speak to the person who did make it? They said, oh, no, I think they're in Australia. Uh, I said, well, is there anybody in there who would like to look at something that's a bit like, and I started pitching the woman on the phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she said, sounds really great, son, but I can't help you. And she said, but thanks for calling. You know, that kind of thing anyway. So she, obviously they may get, must get a million green rubes um, uh, every day. But uh, I mean, look, it was pure naivety. I had one contact in America and I went there because I'd written to Dave Stevens because The Rocketeer had come out. And I, The do Rocketeer was a real – Rocketeer was quite a game changer because it was pr just pre – the big revolution of uh, Dark Knight, Love and Rockets, you know, all that when it happened, you know, American flag, you know, all the when it was, we were on then, the 80s was on. Rocketeer was a bit, sort of a couple of years before it. And I noticed the Rocketeer in the back of, it was Pacific Comics. That's why we, I think we got involved in them with uh, Fruit Wave. Anyway, I went to visit Dave Stevens. I phoned him up and said, hi, this is Brendan. I'm in L.A. Do you mind if I come and say hello? He said, yeah, come around the studio. So I went around and visited him. He's the only contact I had in Hollywood. And he said, you know, I showed him what I had for Freak Wave and showed him some more drawings that I'd done separately. And he said, you know, this would make a great comic. Why don't you get in touch with Pacific? This is the guy's number. And Dave did a phone up, I think it was Steve Shane's on my behalf. And said, listen, there's this guy in here. You've got to meet him. He's fucking amazing. Take a meeting. And so, so he said, okay, I'll see him tomorrow, three o'clock. I said, great. He said, oh, they're in San Diego. I went, oh, all right, how do I get there? And so uh, I got on a train and went down to San Diego and found the office, went in there, and they signed us up on the spot and said, okay, we'd like Freak Wave, uh, a three-part series, eight pages each, and we'll do it 
as the back up, back end of this anthology they were doing. So that's our, that was our debut, and um, it was the most popular thing in the in that magazine in that anthology comic, and they got a great reaction to it. So they offered us their own comic, and we said, "Well, we'd like to do a three part mini series, but it's going to be kind of anthology style, but kind of like crazy and far out." And they said, "Sounds great," because obviously there was they were coming from the '60s, but they knew that they could see in in the work we were doing that there was that anarchic '60s vibe. But uh, it, there was a new sensibility, you know. It was, a, it was Mad Maxi. It was punk. It was, you know, you know, it had that sort of something going for it that was uh, had quality. So, um, so that's how we, uh, that's how I broke into American comics. Uh, you know, by getting on a plane, going there, failing miserably in Hollywood, but hitting into the comic scene. You know, and Dave Stevens, God bless him, was uh, he was a really lovely guy actually, and he. Came to London once and we met up. Uh, he was really into strip clubs. For ex- he used to know all these models. He uh, he was all he was all surrounded by strippers and babes. Dave Stevens. He was an incredible guy. Nice, very nice fellow. He's really, really, you know, generous and with his time. And uh, you know, it, sometimes the comic scene can be quite tough. People, you know, are very competitive and stuff. But he was uh, very relaxed and. Uh, you know, he was a big. He hated Freakwave when we did it in Strange Days because he thought it was just like an abstract mess. But he loved Paradox. He thought that was, you know, because that's more his sensibility. Brandon, you you uh, you know, you mentioned this is kind of your beginning in the American comics market, and this is where you know we come to know your work from yeah. Pacific and, and really from Eclipse, that second the Strange Days anthology uh, that I guess came next. Did yeah. you have a sense of how that work was being received here in America? Because, uh, you know, you mentioned its quality, but besides the quality is it had a very unique sensibility, like nothing else looked like the work you were doing there. Um, were you getting, you know, were you, did you get a sense of that? Like, what was the reaction that you saw or felt from that work? Look, we were told people liked it, but there was no reaction. And, and one of the things that's always baffled me you know, as somebody who was wanting to get into it and also to be successful, to create successful comic book characters and things like that, is that none of our stuff ever caught on or was ever reviewed or, you know, Fantagram, what was that, what was that, Comics Journal, any of those people completely ignored everything we did all through that whole 80s heyday. I mean, to be fair, most of the oxygen was sucked out of the room by Watchmen and Alan Moore and then, you know, Neil Gaiman and Sandman and... That, that sort of stuff. It was when comics went over to becoming writer centric as well. So the artist was seen as the assistant to the writer, as it were, in the production of the comic. And um, that's been a thing that's always, I've always found bizarre. It was part of the reason I got out of comics in the end. I just thought, well, I've given this a good 10, 15 years, and I haven't really made the impact that I thought I'd make. Uh, so it looks like, you know, I've done, I've satisfied my own artistic, uh, desire and produce comics that I can be proud of. And I'll, as artifacts, I can put them next to Ziggy Stardust album or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, something, a good movie or, you know, I feel like, yeah, okay. I've put something into the culture that is of value to, to a certain type of sensibility. But it never, none of my stuff or stuff I did with Pete Mulligan ever really uh, clicked, you know. I, but I do get people now and then say, oh, hey, man, I remember that, you know. I walked into a comic shop once in America, and there was this old guy, older guy behind the thing. And I, and I was chatting to him, and I, I said, oh, yeah, I'm a comic book artist from England. And he said, what do you do? I said, I did something called Strange Days and Paradise. He goes, oh, my God. And then he started going on about, this strip I did in the Paradox comic about these two old codgers that I did with Pete Milligan called Rudcliffe and Williams, who float around in a bed in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and uh, he loved this strip and he was obsessed with it. And he, he was, that's all he talked about. So now and then that is a great thing when you meet somebody um, like the, the, the weirdest example of that was um, when I went over to Australia to do the Mad Max film with George Miller, I was, I was, you know, obviously a huge admirer of George Miller's work, particularly Road Warrior. But there was another person in Australia I was very keen to meet was a guy called Martin Sharp. Martin Sharp had designed Oz magazine. 
Osmite magazine was a British underground colour magazine printed on glossy paper that looked like a Bay Area psychedelic poster. The whole thing was lime green type on pink paper and, you know, like you, you, could, you couldn't really read it. It was almost indecipherable. <laughs> But it was it looked fantastic and it was it was really scurrilous. It was, you know, really filthy stuff in it and you know, it was like a great underground magazine and it reprinted that's where I first saw Robert Crumb's work, you know, who I think is the greatest of all the comic book creators ever. You know, he's, I think he's number one. And um uh, seeing all that stuff was fantastic and um I wanted to meet Martin Sharp. And he was the guy who did, for example, do you know the Cream record, Disraeli Gears? Yes. Uh, it's a beautiful psychedelic uh, album cover. He did that. He did a famous poster of Jimi Hendrix, psychedelic poster, psychedelic poster of Bob Dylan. Um, uh, he was a cooler version of Peter Max, who I always thought was a bit, you know, he's a bit naff, really, wasn't he? Um, but um, so uh, Martin Sharp. So eventually I got somebody who knew him, and he was still alive. In, he was quite old. He was in his 60s when I met him. And uh, uh, I phoned him up and said, listen, my name's, you know, I'm over here doing a Mad Max film, but I would love to, I just want to say how much your work means to me. And I used to love Oz Magazine and da, da, da. He said, hang on a minute, is your name Brendan McCarthy? I said, yeah. He goes, I can't believe it. I've got your comics. I'm like, what? And so I went around to see him, and he pulled out Strange Days, and he had got all my comics and I thought how did this guy know about me and he just for some reason picked up on my stuff because there was an Australian influence in uh, my stuff at that time from being you know rolled over by Road Warrior I put in sort of Australian iconography um, so uh, that was that was great meeting uh, Martin Sharp so that's that was the best example of somebody knowing my work who I hadn't expected but um, yeah comics I mean look for me to put up with what I put up with in my heyday of doing comics, which was living under the poverty line for 10 years and never getting any acknowledgement, you had to really love them to do them. And so I did them, and then I felt like I've done it now. And, um, you know, in a way, you know, I had far more success in the film and television industry than I ever had in comics. But uh, it was other people's stuff, which kind of, in the end, my aim in film and TV was to get my stuff done. Uh, I wasn't successful at that. I did, you know, obviously turn mad you know to chance to reboot mad max was terrific for me but and you know to creating tv series from scratch like reboot reboot is one that i feel a bit of creative uh, ownership about because i i really i you know i created the visuals to that so the look of reboot which i think stands up today still uh was down to me um so uh but um yeah it was odd to, it was odd with comics and it, now I've come back into comics a second time. I don't have the expectation of um, setting the world on light and radicalizing it all and, you know, whatever, burning down my house kind of stuff. I'd, uh, I, I just feel like more like – I feel like more like a, an old blues guitarist doing my riffs, you know. I don't know, something like that. It's so interesting. Uh, you know, like I always think of the Velvet Underground as a band that wasn't particularly popular at the time, but then, you know, everybody – they, the, the joke is everyone who saw them play live went on to start a band, uh, you know, or to a musical career because of their that's influence. What, that's what Alice said about Strange Days. Everybody read Strange Days went on to do their own comic. <laughs> I also think um, whenever you do something new, and, and you being anyone, you know, the, the new thing, like, you, you kind of, you give it away, you know, like, people aren't ready for it. Um, I think of actors, right? Like, Will Ferrell gets paid to be Will Ferrell, or, or Adam Sandler gets paid to do Adam Sandler, but if you do something new and different, it's almost like uh, you need to show and prove, you know, like that first new thing yeah. is people don't know how to respond or what to make of it. And, you know, that's one of my big takeaways from your work is the newness, is that unique quality. And I think anytime something unique shows up, everybody's like, I don't know how to sum this up in one sentence. You know, I don't I can't do yeah. this. Jaws crossed with commando. You know, it's it's a it's a harder thing to sell because it's new. We haven't seen something that looks like this. And sometimes it has yeah. a longer tail, you know, that influence goes on and on. But I can see that initial response is just like, I don't know what to make of this. Yeah, uh, that's that's true. Um, I mean, you can only do what your DNA lets you do in the end. You know, you, you know, I mean, I'm born on the planet at this particular time period. And I was lucky enough to grow. You know, I've been probably 
been fortunate enough to have been born in probably the best era of humanity, really, if you think about it for the average person. I mean, I come from a blue-collar, working-class background. And for me, to come out of that background wanting to be an artist and then go to art, to go to the best art college in the country and, you know, be taught by one of the our most greatest artists, Patrick Caulfield, uh, a pop, pop art colorist. Um, all that sort of stuff was unheard of, you know, back in those days for working class people to become emancipated in not just in a way, you know, in terms of, you know, slave wages and stuff, but in terms of that's 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 why I think the cultural explosion of the 60s was about the working class exploding outwards in culture. And that's why that amazing uh, release of energy culturally and which has obviously changed everything. And one of the things that I think, you know, sometimes, you know, be careful what you wish for in case you get it is um, one of the things that I liked about comics was that it was a working class art form and all the middle class culture vultures despised and look down on comics as worthless crap. And when you went into the industry where it was that, when I first went into comics, it was kind of the arse end of the newspaper industry. It was full of alcoholics and people waiting out their retirement sort of thing. And comics were nothing. But obviously people like myself, and Brett Ewins and Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons and Brian Bolland and all those people that came into it saw what it could be. And that vision was shared amongst our generation. And um, so we knew that comics could be a viable art form. You know, it was almost like the visual equivalent to me of pop music. You know, like it hadn't been got at. It was still pure and you could just do what you wanted. And we were setting the agenda. The problem with the gentrification of comics, which is what happened, is that all the kind of hipsters moved into it. All the book publishers moved into it. They branded them graphic novels. I mean, on the rare occasion I go to a, a dinner party, if you know what they are, where you, do you know what, do you have them in America? You get invited around somebody's house and there's about seven people around a table. I, I don't get invited to those kind of things. <laughs> well, I don't like them and I don't ever go to them anymore, but a few times I went to them. If I said to people at a dinner party and they'd say, oh, Brendan, what do you do? And I'd say, um, uh, I draw comics. They'd go, oh, right. Uh, anyway, and, and, you know, and that, that would be, if you say, I drew graphic novels, it's, oh, really? You know, there's a sort of there was a there's a cultural difference. So, what we what happened to the comic book industry is, is it went um, bourgeois and it went middle class, and now it has you know we have our own comics laureate, uh, and we're uh, because the people a lot of the people in the comics industry suffer from what's called cult cultural cringe, which is a, an obsequious towards higher high culture coming from a low culture background. Now I don't have that particular hang up because I've been through the whole fine art process and uh, you know I don't need to see a comic done by Lichtenstein to appreciate the work in the actual comic you know so but some people do a lot of those people do and you've got a lot of those kind of people that came into the comic industry who were kind of gatekeepers to the high art world so you might get an exhibition of comic art at you know a, a museum or something usually shunted somewhere near the toilets down in the basement of the museum you know but uh, nonetheless the, the idea was aren't we making progress people are now putting comics behind glass boxes with little labels on them and so they give people the museum experience or the art gallery experience of looking at the co of com comic as an object and uh, all that stuff is baloney because the actual experience of the comic is the holding of it and the turning of the page and the reading of it that's the comic experience, not the gazing at a comic through a glass barrier as we uh, pretend it's a, an object they are, you know. So there's been a downside to all that stuff. Uh, so, you know, I, I, anyway, I came into the comic industry at the right time for me when it was anarchic. There weren't any rules. People didn't know what the fuck was going on. And we were making it up as we went along. And then you had those big whammo breakthroughs like Watchmen, Dark Knight, and then all that, and those two, as the two big ones, bolstered then by Love and Rockets, American Flag, Strange Days, Rogan Gosh, you know, all my stuff, then Grant Morrison's early stuff, you know, St. Swithin's Day, and, you know, all the, I love Doom Patrol was a great one, I think that's his best series for me, and um, lots of people like that, you know, but as I say, really, the oxygen in the room was 
sucked out by uh, Watchmen and Dark Knight, really. So it was an odd, that was a very odd time to do be doing really radical work, stuff like Skin, and not get any um, feedback at all on it. You know, in in Britain we had a bit because it got banned and that became the story, not the actual strip. But that it was banned became a news story. Um, yeah, that's a, that was that was uh, that was a peculiar sort of thing. Also, I ended up before I left comics as being everybody's favourite cult artist. You know, like the guy who nobody who, whose comics nobody buys but everybody likes. You know, like, and after a while, I got I got sick of being you know the cult guy, and uh, I just slipped away from it all and began a completely new career in pop video and in uh, uh, animation and film. Because after 15 years of sitting in a room drawing, and with not much happening other than what's going on in my head, uh, I just wanted some adventure. And the film industry gave me that because I got to travel the world. You know, I've seen, so you know, and I just, you know, I, 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 you know, I started living and meeting loads of people, film crews, dealing with TV shows, going into story meetings with executives in Hollywood, you know, all that experience unraveled to me. Uh, you know, and I had, I had lots of fun for, for, for 50, for about 20 years of Hollywood. Uh, you know, it's been really, it was really good actually. I, I really had a great time and, uh, I was a kid in a candy store really, really had fun. Before we get into Hollywood, I wonder if you had any stories about the publishing of Skin um, it came out through Tundra here in the States, and, and Tundra is a pretty legendary publisher for us. Um, you know, being connected to Kevin Eastman, some of the work that they published, and some of the stories behind that publisher. Did, did you have any uh, any interesting stories about working with Tundra and, and Kevin Eastman? Um, I'm afraid I don't, actually. I know there are great stories of bacchanalian parties and all that stuff under the Tundra Ninja Turtles dollars, but... Uh, you know what, um, the, the, Kevin Eastman was fantastic because I'd worked on, um, I worked on the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Uh, I remember the director, Steve Barron, who I, he was the premier pop video director of the era and I started working with him and he loved my stuff and we just hit it off and we just had a great rapport. And Steve did all those fantastic classic pop videos of the 80s, you know, like Take On Me where the comic book comes alive and... Um, Billy Jean is not my lover. Michael Jackson dancing on lighted squares and loads of all those early Madonna ones and Don't You Want Me Baby, Human League, and and crucially he also did the the um, Money for Nothing and the Chicks for Free, the computer animated. Uh, if you remember that one about those warehouse guys yes. stacking boxes, right? That was culturally absolutely crucial because the guys who did that animation which was the first three minute bit of cgi although very crude they're the guys that went on to do reboot tv series and steve barron produced reboot and got it in front of uh you know a t television network who fund part funded it and then they stitched together the deal so that was really interesting how all that computer animation really came out of pop video um so um one day, Steve Barron calls me up and says, have you ever heard of something called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I said, yeah, of course. It's like this giant comic book phenomenon. Why? He goes, well, I've just been offered a film of it. I said, do it. It'll be huge. And so uh, he decided to do the movie, and uh, I was involved in you know, designing the turtles to make them work. And we had to get them made by the Henson Creature Workshop, who made all the Muppets and stuff like that, because they were the leading, probably one of the leading, in Britain, anyway, they were the leading uh, animatronics type of uh, place. And it was all done through radio control and, you know, they could operate levers to raise eyebrows, you know, all that stuff. So in order to get the Ninja Turtles, they had to find, I think they found six Asian ninja acrobats who were also extremely small. And, that's, and they found them, and they trained them all up, and they got them in these suits, and they would radio control all the faces and stuff while these guys did all the ninja stuff. Anyway, that's a diversion into Ninja Turtles, but um, it was fun. That was that was uh, my first big Hollywood movie to work on and really get to sort of see how the process was working. It was Steve Barron's first Hollywood movie, so he had a lot riding on it. And um, uh, Kevin Eastman, of course, it 
Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the very first what, movie, was the biggest grossing um, cost-to-profit cost film ever made. And that record had been held previously by Mad Max 1, the first Mad Max film, because that had only cost half a million to make, and it made 100 million worldwide. And then Ninja Turtles came in, cost, I don't know what it was, might have been 8 million, I don't know, I can't remember the number now, and went on to make, you know, gazillions, and was huge. And obviously Kevin Eastman was then flush. Um, so, uh, so when Kevin Eastman heard about skin and the problems we were having, we were, we were finally getting blocked by British Customs, who said that if you, if you attempt to import that comic into the country, we'll seize it for obscenity. Uh, so Kevin Eastman said, no, I'm going to publish the comic and I'm going to fight a court case on obscenity. This is ridiculous. So we told him that's our plan and uh, Kevin Eastman went for it. And I thought I really admired his balls to really go for it. And um, in the end, customs rolled over and said nothing. And the, finally the strip, the book finally came out and everybody said, what's all the fuss about? You know? So there you go. It feels like it's one of those books that is an early graphic novel uh, that would have an influence on the direction comics went, where it was like, look, comics can tackle something that's not silly superheroes, but a much heavier subject matter. Yeah, the problem with skin, though, is um, I hadn't realized this, because I grew up in a white working class background, and I grew up through the hippie period, and it just at the end of the 60s, early 70s, skinheads appeared growing out of what were called mods. Mods and rockers were two different teenage tribes that used to fight a lot. You know, uh, there's a film, Quadrophenia, uh, explains the story of the mods. Anyway, out of the mods, who were very smartly dressed and liked their clothes, came skinheads who used to listen to West Indian reggae music. So they were a kind of a strange combo, you know, and... Uh, they were very into football, and then gradually they went very right wing, and all that aggro and clockwork orange type violence happened. But that was after. So when I was about eleven, I used to hang around with because that was the new thing going on. But then glam rock came along with Mark Boland and David Bowie, and I dropped all that and just went into that because that was more my thing. I wasn't really that interested in it. So I just remember. So Skin was based on an urban youth cult of the time, early seventies, that has latterly become so toxic skinheads are so toxic you can't do anything about them so i didn't realize that at the time that skin was suffering in america which is why it would never got mentioned or reviewed anywhere because suddenly it was oh skin skinheads ugh, you know and um in britain there was a, it was more understood because you'd had a a kind of cult of skinheads then suede heads then bother girls you know there was all these kind of different cults around, that's youth cults. England was an amazing place for <laughs> incubating youth cults. As it's sadly that stopped now. I've always looked forward to the next youth cult to come out of England where something will be, they'll look amazing, the music will be brand new and fantastic. And sadly, it's all ended up as Coldplay mush. You know, that's all you get now, isn't it? You know? I was going to say Spice Girls, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, it, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I guess I didn't think about that, but just context in the 90s like when skin comes out here in america there's all those talk shows that would exploit like weird subcultures and geraldo getting his nose busted right. on tv by a bunch of skinheads yeah. like of course yeah. like it, it, it's totally clear when you when you put it in that context but uh brendan this is if you if you couldn't tell already man this is a very nerdy youtube channel uh so i would like to get into just a little bit of the details and the audience can keep up, uh, but we cannot have a conversation without talking about um, this brilliant use of color that you're very well known for uh, with with your comics. And I'm looking at some pages from Rogue and Gosh right, right at this minute, and I'm seeing a lot of the keywords that you mentioned throughout the conversation. Pop art, psychedelia, specifically lime green next to fluorescent pink. Uh, I would like to know just some of your... Um, some of your thoughts on color, and if you can walk us through a page 
of uh, you know coloring a page using that that old arcane blue line method because Jim and I speak anecdotally and I'd like to have something on the record from a guy who is actually there getting dirty with uh, paints and pigments. Yes. Well, Rogue and Gosh was not done blue line. And Paradax was done blue line. Okay. Rogue and Gosh is fully painted, and it was all done on uh, twice up artboards. Wow. Jeez. If you look at Strange Days, all of Strange uh, Freakways was, was a fully painted strip, but um, Paradax and Johnny Nemo in Strange Days were done blue line. Okay, let, let me let me revise then. Uh, walk us through like a page of. I'm looking at the psychedelia of Rogan Gosh, and right. I'm so curious about some of the different uh, media that you used, but also your use of. Uh, the like, what would you call it? Textures or shapes? There'd be polka dots next to stripes, next to like a bullseye kind of yeah. image. Well, I just organically developed uh, my own iconography, you know, and uh, uh, I guess it's in a way of distinguishing yourself by style. So you could immediately look at something, and go, "Oh, that's a Brendan McCarthy, or that's a Picasso, or that's a Ditko." You know, you can tell. I wanted, I guess, you, I'm, so, you know, I'm. I'm aware that I'm parlaying style as a factor in my work. You know, I'm not oblivious to my own style. And I manipulate style just like, you know, the Beatles would do a song in the style of a 1920s honey pie or, you know, a crazy heavy metal rock song like Helter Skelter. Say, for example, you've got two different types. So um, with um, Rogan Gosh, I wanted to do it it, it. it was it was designed to be a, a very like a tapestry, a psychedelic tapestry of simulating. I don't know an opium dream or something like that. You know, so once you've got that as your parameter, uh, you know it's going to dictate how I then approach the uh, stuff. Can I just make? There's a couple of points I'd like to make though about how I. Uh, to, to, just before we go to the art, yes. what my philosophy is before I'm going to the art is that, um, as I say, I'm extremely bored in the main by comics that ape films. Yes. There are obviously fantastic exceptions like Will Eisner, The Watchmen, you know, Dark Knight, you know, really great examples of comics as film, you know, and, and undoubtedly some of the greatest examples of comics made. But for me personally, I'm not interested in doing it that way because may, it might have come from, I don't think it is actually because I worked in film after I did comics. And once I started storyboarding in film, the last thing I want to do is go back to comics and just start storyboarding in comics. I find that really boring. So I have a problem with comic book artists who derive their comics from photographs, for example. Now, there's some, some of those guys are fantastic. Like, is it Jean-Paul Leon? Do you know his work? Yes. It's quite a photographically based artist, but he's a guy that brings smarts to that process and really flips it up into something else. So I dig him. But there's a lot of your average standard kind of comic book artist who's just, you can look at the, you can see the photographic reference they were using in the drawing. And uh, I don't want to see, a photograph interprets the world already for you, and then you're just into 2D, and then you're copying the 2D. And I find that boring. It's not. In, it's like they haven't explored reality. They just looked at a photograph for reference. So my thing is to be. I'm reality based in how I do my comics, and I'm not doing them so they resemble films. So that's how I'm coming into it from the beginning, right? Just so that's my ground base. You know, one of the things I would say to people: if you look, read Rogan Gosh, or you look at say Sorcerer Zilp, Dream Gang, Freak Wave, whatever. A big influence on me, on me has been pop videos. So if you, for example, so a lot of people get frustrated or don't like my work because they say, well, it, it's it's not like a film or it's, it's the same off with it, you know. It's ju jumpy or jerky. Uh, and uh, if I say, if you just think of a pop video when you look at my stuff, it suddenly clicks and you get, oh, I get what he's doing now. He's sort of getting a sort of choppier vibe rhythm going in his comic pages than you would if you were doing it like a film where you don't want to intrude in the interior narrative that you're showing. Whereas I'm prepared to cut and use, use blocks of color and patterns and stuff like that to 
to create a kind of visual rhythm and beat through the, the, the music of the comic. So my analogy is my comics are derived from music rather than from film. And if you, if you example, see your comic as the, the text is lyrics and I'm pr producing the music, it suddenly opens the whole thing up. So if you see Rogue and Gosh, like Pete did the lyrics and I did the music, and we both, before doing that, agreed on the song, what it would be about, um, that then gives you interesting structures. Whereas you say, right, this is going to be a movie, so we need to set up the protagonist, we need to do a an inciting incident, and by the end we've got to pay off these things that we set up, blah, blah, blah. You know, like how movie-type comics play out. So already I've adopted a separate, a, a different viewpoint to um, uh, how I'm going to tell the story, and, what, and also it's about what experience I want to give you. I really believe in the comic experience. And that's something I think people are forgetting, is that the comic experience, for me, although I read a lot of stuff digitally now because I don't have a comic shop near me, um, that idea of holding a magazine, reading printed images, turning the page, which is an important part of it, the sequences of panels and then turning the page, you know, the tactile nature of it, putting it down, picking it up again and looking at certain sequences where you like the drawing or, you know, all that kind of thing about the comic book experience is very different to the film experience. In fact, it's always nothing like it, you know. And uh, that's why I think it's a bizarre thing to want to ape a film in comics. I understand that film executives then go, oh, yeah, I could see this as a movie, buy it, you know. But um, anyway, it bores the crap out of me, all that stuff. And uh, something that's more exciting. I just want to make comics exciting. I see them in a different way. I see them looking differently to how they look now. I see them, like the latest one I did, Zorcerer Zilk. And even, you know, as you brought up, Rogan Gosh, I sort of wanted to see comics looking like that. I wanted to see comics like that rather than, I don't know, other stuff I was seeing, which kind of looked the same, you know. So, um I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm talking about the basic premise of how I approach comics, which is comics is music, text is lyrics, and the art is the music. Um, remember, that's just an analogy, and I, I'm not taking it literally, but sure. yeah. So, if, an example, say for example, um, one I think one of the great cultural I, I pieces of work of the last sort of 40 years is. Um, uh, the pop video to Once in a Lifetime by Talking Heads. Do you remember that? That, that is a hugely I iconic piece of work because the song itself is iconic. But when you put it with the visuals of all those, with him doing all that weird jerky dancing and walking, you know, all the repeated images. Uh, if you remember, do you remember the pop video? I don't, I confess. Yeah, okay. Well, go and have a look at it. it, was, it back, back in the day, it was the sort of... Uh, the pop video itself became a bit like comics. They became a mini little art form unto themselves, you know. So I used to see comics as like releasing a single. So um, when I did Strange Days or Paradox comic, there were three stories in each. I didn't see that. I didn't see it as anthology. I just saw like the main track would be Paradox because that was the commercial one. It was superhero. But there'd be other two other tracks in it that were just as good but were a bit more obscure. So that's how I saw how that stuff came out into the market. I saw them like pop singles. So I've always had that analogy about my comics rather than serving a kind of film analogy. That's awesome, man. I There's so much to chew on. We could have a 10-hour conversation just, just on that alone. I do have right. just, just one other uh, comic question that uh, I've sort of always had a, about the work, Skin in particular, and it's the right. uh, it's the collaboration with Carol Swain. She's a cartoonist oh. that, that I like a whole lot. And yeah, she's I, beautiful. I think I have her entire bibliography and have oh. dug it, you know, since I was a kid. But uh, what was her contribution? How, like, I, I see Carol Swain in some of the pages, and uh, but I can't yeah. tell what the division of labor was there. Yeah, um, well, you could probably say, you, you could probably see the more, the more wrought bits of art, where I'd have to really draw into it, that you'll see me because I'm using the pastels and stuff. Um, when I was doing when I was doing the art to Skin, you remember the premise of Skin is this is a story told by a 14 year old working class skinhead 
who's fuck this and fuck that and you fucking you know it's it's that's the world he comes from so the idea was that we we're going to write it in that narrative voice and uh i felt that i can't in order to draw it i'm going to i'm going to draw it in the same style as the narrative voice which is i'm going to draw it crudely so it looks a bit rough hewn and a bit dodgy in the art you know so i didn't want to make it too sophisticated in the you know, give it the full on, you know, airbrush look or something, you know, that didn't suit it. I wanted something with grain in it and, and rough hewn. And I loved Carol Swain's work. I thought it was really brilliant urban art and uh, fantastic stuff. I loved the grain of her crayon. She uses a black crayon to draw on like those laundry pencils. And um, uh, so I just, I phoned her up and said, listen, I've got, I'm doing this sort of strip, and uh, I want. I, I know you've probably never done this before, but do you want to try it just for the sheer hell of it? And so uh, I asked her to. So I gave her a couple of pages to do, and they came back, and I thought oh, this is really interesting. She's bringing something to the game here, and um, so I would basically just draw. I would draw the whole page in pencil, pencil it up, and then I would take a, a thin felt pen or a marker pen, and I would do a thin line of of what's on the page, erase everything else. So there was a thin line on colored paper. I was using colored, big sheets of colored paper to draw. And then I, you know, one page might be bright yellow, another one might be blue, red, you know, whatever. So I'd give her the pages, say six at a time, and then she'd, I'd meet her up and she'd give, show me the pages. And then I'd look at them and where they w work really well, I'd just leave them alone. And there were particular shots that she did of uh, the, the central character called Martin Atchison. Well, she made him look like this cherubic baby. And I, I realized the effect that she was bringing to it was to make it re really humanize him and make him really sympathetic. That you, even though this kid is absolutely crazy, mad, angry, and you can't believe what's, what world of nightmare he's in, somehow she's bringing out this beautiful softness in him. And I, I took pains not to overdraw on top of that stuff. Now, there were bits where, because she wasn't used to this kind of comic, she might sort of fluff it a bit or not quite get it right. Like an arm might look bad and not. she's lost, the, say, the line of the shirt or something, you know, so it's not looking like fabric. So I'd work into it and I'd draw bits in. and So that was how I'd do it. I would get the stuff back from her and then I would drop, I would draw into it where it needed it and leave it where it didn't need it. So uh, she was, you know, it's absolutely uh, Pete Milligan, myself, and Carol Swain are the three people involved in Skin to get that uh, look. Uh, I, I must say, I got, to, I got to say, it, Skin is really dear to my heart because it's just like the character in, in the comic of Skin. Nobody wants anything to do with him. He's like disgusting. He's smell. Get him away. He's a social embarrassment. And that's a bit like skin comic. Oh, it's about skinheads. It's a bit. Un it's uncool. We don't like that. You know. Uh, and it got turned down by everybody. You know. All those great graphic novel. But this, when the first wave of comics aren't for kids anymore happened, we had all these guys like Penguin Books come in. If they don't want to publish skin, we'll publish it. And then they'd come in, read it, and go. Um, Lost. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't so. It, I loved how I didn't love it, but uh, I it kind of endeared me to the comic even more. Every time we'd get rejected by one of these big right on publishers, uh, because this even they it was too much for them, which I loved. Um, uh, it kind of just endeared me to it even more. So, of all you know, I guess you always love your uh, the awkward child, you know, the one that nobody else likes. You know? I'm gonna have to ask my dad about that one then. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I know precious little about uh, Carol as a cartoonist. I don't, so I don't know, like, did, did you have to um, send the pages across the pond or is she, is she British? Oh, yeah, she's British. She lives in London and I was living in London at the time. So we just, uh, you know, we'd meet in a cafe or something, have a chat. You know, I didn't know her, so I wanted to make her feel relaxed and, you know, but she, you know, she do. Look, we were all, there was a big, comic scene going on it's the you know it was happening in london in the 80s it was happening you know if you would have if you would have asked me uh where she was from i would have said seattle because i so closely associate her with fantagraphics and and that whole crew yeah. off there 
So I'm, I'm glad to yeah, she's, And also, she's almost completely unknown, which is, you know, you think I'm obscure. You think, wait till you see how little known Carol Swain is to, you know. I mean, what, what I like about your uh, comment and why I agree to do this is that you, you're, you know, you, you, you walk down some of the laneways and avenues that other people don't, which is why I like it. Uh, you know, you do your wizard coverage and the mainstream <laughs> stuff, but you also allow for people like myself and uh, to mention carol swain you know there's i mean i just think it's ridiculous that people like her aren't acknowledged as one of the best comic book artists writers creators that england's produced i think she's fantastic you know she's intrinsically british her work comes out of uh, working class life it's you know there's elements of fanciful of the fanciful in it, but at the same time it's very urban. It's it's rooted in the ground, and that's why she suited Skin so much. You don't understand. Also, the release date of Skin was Skin was done before Rogan and Gosh. Wow. But it was published after Rogan and Gosh. So, so, so one the thing is that we did um, we were doing Skin for a British comic book company called Crisis uh, magazine called Crisis which was published by the same people in 2000 AD. It was a very right-on, uh, left-wing agitprop type of uh, type magazine, and it had some nice strips in it, had some really terrible strips in it. Anyway, we, we were going to do uh, Skin for them. That's where the whole shit show started, was with them, because the union who was running the printers said, we're not printing this because it's obscene, because it's showing, you know, uh, disabled people, because there's a, there's a sexual assault in it where he assaults his friend. Skin was basically, it was a bit of a pain in the arse skin because, you know, I mean, getting banned is nice to talk about it now. But back then it was uh, a loss of income, uh, you know, all it meant was more grinding poverty for me for another six months or something. Yeah, this is a lot of work. This is this is very rigorous work and to have that sit on the shelf and, and just knowing, you know, like in our own careers in publishing, it's like, okay, you spend a year making a book. Uh, a year promoting it like before it's even published and then when it comes out it's still six months before you get your first royalty check it's a hell of an investment of time and resources uh, to uh to do this I, thing we're very uh, privileged yeah look i was prepared to make all those sacrifices when i was younger because of my, you know it's look we all know that it's a vocation for those of us who've been in it for the long haul you know you're not you're not i haven't been doing it for the riches i can assure you you know right um, you know, I'm, my hat's off to those people who have made a huge success of it and are millionaires, Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman and, you know, Rob Liefeld and all those people. Fantastic. I'd love to have had that success with my stuff. But it didn't happen. And I found success elsewhere, strangely in medium that I like, but not as much as comics. And um, uh, it, it was a funny thing coming back to comics because once I'd done Mad Max and I thought, well, really, I'm not going to do anything better than this. And this is the... If there was ever a movie or a thing that I could have done, you know, that's it. To do, to suggest and come up with and work on a new Mad Max film was like, okay, it's probably not going to get back in this. I mean, the only thing I could think of would be to work on a new Beatles album or something, you know, like something really monumental to me. I'm just talking about what my value systems are. And um, so... Uh, once that had been done, I just thought I'd just come back into comics because I missed them and I wanted to draw some comics and see, have that comic experience again. And um, the great thing about 2000 AD in, in London, in, sorry, in England is, and it's across the British Isles, is that it's the last of the, of the British comics that isn't a toy uh, promotion. That's what our, most of our comics, 90% of our comics are just, you know, My Little Mermaid or whatever it's called, and there's a comic that goes with the package. That's what a lot of that stuff is now. So 2000 AD stands as the last place you can actually tell an intelligent, very British story if you want. And it's going to be on sale in newsagents, newsstands all around the country. Like, And so what I wanted to do was reach me at age 15. So I did the Zorcer Result, which is the strip we just finished. It was pitched to a younger audience than I would normally pitch my stuff because I wanted to get to – I know there's really – kids with some sus up in stairs that are really like I was when I was 15. You know, I was open to it and I was looking, you know, I'm looking for it, for the stuff that's going to signal that, you know, that wakes you up, you know. And I just thought I'm going to do that with with my stuff, just put it out into the public because I like it. I like to bypass that whole comic 
scene, you know, in the sense of I want it to get out to plumbers and ordinary people like I was when I first started seeing it, you know. So um, that's been a kind of, has, there hasn't been a mission this time around. It's just that uh, I feel like I established, I, I got a level of success in another field and I thought, well, okay, I feel satisfied with that. I can now afford to go back into poverty and obscurity doing comics again. <laughs> We have to talk Mad Max Fury Road. Where do we begin? I know that uh, the the bulk of your work was principally done in the late 1990s, just to give people some yeah. clue into how yeah. long it took gestation period for Mad Max Fury Road to come out. Right. So your contribution, how did that uh, begin? I know you met George Miller. We talked about Australia, but uh, when you really started getting into the nitty gritty to, to construct what was going to be Fury Road, how did that shake out? I did a TV series, computer animated TV series called Reboot, which came out a couple of years before uh, Pixar released Toy Story. It was the first, it was incredibly groundbreaking because it was the first full length, it was the first long form CGI TV series. And uh, so, so I was really feeling like, I felt like we'd broken through a barrier in comics in the 80s. And I, as soon as I saw the computer animation, the tests for Reboot, I, uh, I thought, wow, this is this is completely new and is going to be the future of animation. And animation is going to explode into a new direction. And so I felt I was in the ground floor again of a brand new revolution after comics, this time in animation, in CGI. So one of the um, one of the uh, episodes we did, each one was sort of pastiching different genres. I suggested we do one pastiching Mad Max, The Road Warrior. Um, and it was called Bad Bob. The central character in Reboot was called Bob. So I called it Bad Bob. And we just basically took all little moments from the Mad Max films and dropped them into this sort of popular pastiche of Mad Max. Well, once we'd finished it and we had an edited final version of it, uh, I, put, I put it on a VHS tape, which is what was used back then. And I put it in the post with a little post-it note stuck on the VHS saying, Whatever happened to Mad Max? Question mark. And I sent it to George Miller in Sydney. And out of the blue, a couple of months later, I get a phone call from his uh, producing partner, Doug. He says, "You know, what's all this about? What is it?" I said, "Oh, it's computer animation. It's it's, it's going to be huge. It's the new thing." And then um, they said, "Listen, we're going. We're going to be in Hollywood uh, in LA in a couple of weeks. Can we meet you? Because we've got something we'd like to talk about." I said, sure. So I flew to Hollywood pretending I lived there just to <laughs> to meet George Miller. Because I just I, I thought it was worth it just to meet him anyway, you know, just to say Mad Max blew my head off. Brilliant. One of the best action movies ever made. So anyway, I I go along to meet him. They were basically planning a Mad Max TV series. Like in those days, it was Xena, Warrior Princess, Hercules, those cable TV shows. They were, Warner Brothers had asked George Miller, can you do us a Mad Max TV show like that? And uh, in the course of the conversation, I knew all of George's work, and plus I knew the Mad Max film back to front. So he probably thought I was a nutcase, but I chewed his leg off for about the 10 minute meeting ended up being like sort of like two hours or something. We ended up having, you know, a bit of lunch and chatting. We, I knew all his stuff so much, and you hear me very personable, and we got on really just clicked really well. And so I, I basically just said to him, look, as far as I'm concerned, a Mad Max TV series is great. But what really I want to see is a fucking amazing new Mad Max movie. I said, that's, that's scary to do that. Whereas the TV says, yeah, it'd be good, it'd be nice, we'd all like it. But a new movie, man, that is, that's something. And uh, I pitched him an idea for a film. I said, you know, and if there's anything he would use, go for it, because I'm never going to make a Mad Max film. You know, I'll, but I'll guarantee you one thing, you'll have one customer, me, to see it. <laughs> right? Anyway. I get a phone call a few months later from it, from George, phones up to say, and I just uh, wondered how you'd fix. I said, well, yeah, all right, I'm here in Canada. I'm working on just tying up uh, a TV series. He said, would you be interested in coming to Sydney and knocking about some ideas for a Mad Max film? I've been thinking about some things. And I said, yeah. So uh, I initially came over for six months. We just immediately clicked. We just everything about it. I just... I just uh, Look, we, there was a story I had pitched him about a guy breeding a girl because I said it at the extinction, the extinction level of the human race, the point at which humanity goes down. 
which would give a motive for somebody to want to somehow breed a human being that was not subject to toxic cancers and things and uh, could actually stood a chance of survival and somehow to kickstart the human race again. That was the kind of idea. George took that, uh, that idea and then really turned it into something very, where my, re my reveal at the end became the beginning of the movie. And I just thought, of, wow, he's just done that. And then he's added this. He added this amazing character called, who we didn't know what she was called, but she was going to be a female Mad Max with one arm. And I thought, wow, fantastic, you know. And uh, then, you know, and then, and then he'd say, right, I need what we need. You know, I talk about... <clears throat> And what we did was we talked strategically about what a Mad Max movie, what is the Mad Max experience? Because I said, you've got to deliver to this generation what I got off, num off Mad Max 2, which was I staggered out of the cinema after seeing Mad Max 2 with my head smoking, thinking, what the hell have I just seen? You know? And I said, we've got to do the same to a new generation. So we've got to be so amazingly good that, you've, that we've got to top Mad Max 2 because that's our only competition. Because I looked at everything from Bullet to Ronin to, you know, some of the Asian stuff. And I thought in the end, actually, nothing beats the truck chase in Mad Max 2. Uh, so I thought, all right, our competition is ourselves. So um, anyway, um, how, we, so how the division of labor went. And it was very porous. We were in and, in and out of each other's sort of sectors quite a lot. But George was sort of handling in a way the through line. Once he decided that it was going to be a non-stop action movie from beginning to end, but with strategic breaks uh, along the way, just otherwise you're going to get motion sick if it goes on all the time. Um, we constructed it like a roller coaster ride so that we would crank you up. You know, we've got to set the thing up, crank you up, and then you're off. And then wham, you know that first whole sequence where – uh, they go out on, you know, she turns off the road, they're going along the, out into the desert, then the buzzards attack, those little spiky ones with the buzz swords. Um, and then the storm hits, and then they go into the storm, and we've sort of escalated the action up. We've gone from that level of action up into the storm. Now everything's, you know, got, got super cranked up, and then it ends with a, uh, a flare fizzling out into blackness. And that's your first break you've come down now from the roller coaster ride and you're at the bottom of the ride and now you're going to go along for a bit and then we're going to start cranking you back up again right so that's how we were structuring it so i was handling more the tribes and the so you know all the guys spray their mouths and uh spiky vehicles with buzz saws guys on bike bikes jumping over them pole all, all that that's all my side of the film i was the, i was delivering the Mad Max thrills and spill side of it. George was delivering the philosophical, um, you know, the feminine, feminist sort of elements, the uh, story, you know, the steep structural stuff, uh, you know, about set-offs and payoffs and all that kind of stuff. Now, that, that's not really how we were. It's just that I'm saying that was more his area and that, that was more my area over here with the tribes and vehicles. But he would be in and out of it all the time. I, I mean, I remember one day... I was just sitting uh, in, his, in the studio in Sydney, just doodling. And he walked in the morning and said, can you do anything with that? And this was fairly on, early on in the process. And he had a photograph of an acrobat on a pole. It was just a black and white, just a you know, little photograph of an acrobat on a pole. And I thought, if I put them on vehicles, they could become raiding parties. So I got that. I said, three minutes later, I said, they're called pole cats and they're, Board, they bored people like pirates. And he went, great. Unforgettable. That's Unforgettable amazing, stuff. yeah. <laughs> but that idea took that long. You know, so it just goes to show you, like, I learned so much doing that film that the process of doing Mad Max Fury Road was almost exactly the same as doing a comic. So I was completely familiar with how to do it. You know, I just knew how to do it straight away. And also it's amazing. All of us have watched thousands and thousands of hours of TV and film. And intrinsically inside, in our DNA, we know storytelling because it's actually, you've got to remember, storytelling, you know, archetypes, hero journeys, all that stuff is actually in our DNA and it's actually triggered into psychic structures. So we're born with all this stuff already in us. So um, what we had to do is make fealty to the Mad Max myth. So 
I saw my job initially with George Miller was I had to scope him out a bit and I had to make sure that he was in the mindset that produced Mad Max 2. I had to get him there first. And that's, I think, one of the main reasons he hired me. And it was just me and him in a room for a year till we nutted out the whole story. And we had another guy, a great, he, he got this brilliant, um, uh, he's Australia's, I think he's the only underground artist, a guy called Peter Pound. And he sat in the studio with us sometimes as well. He'd draw stuff and he'd do some, there was a lot of very perverse stuff come up with when we were pressing for hard r mad max uh george pulled it back a lot and made it soft r or pg but initially we were all thinking let's go to a true sequel to road warrior and go hardcore so that peter pound who had having a very perverse underground sense of humor that these drawings you couldn't really show your grandmother uh he was a great he was a really good influence to have around so what what i did and what Peter helped to enhance was I pulled George Miller back to his earlier, more rock and roll, anarchic self. You know, the guy that made the first two Mad Maxes, those films were, were like guerrilla filmmaking. And then he went, you know, more Hollywood with Thunderdome, and then he went into Witches, Witches of Eastwick and Babe and, you know, other beautiful work. But it's, it's within the Hollywood sphere. But the first two Mad Max films are a bit more guerrilla. What we couldn't do with Mad Max either was make a cult movie because we knew it was going to cost like a hundred million. So we had we and you know I had these conversations we had off, were openly had with George all the time, where we talk about what kind of movie is this, and we said well, this movie, and we talk about what's it like. Tell me what it was like for you to see Fury Road. This is before we've even written it, and I'd say, well, what I liked about it the most was, and I'd tell we'd play these role playing games where I'd tell George why Fury Road was the best of the Mad Max films before we'd even finished writing it. And I'd say, you know, what was really great was how you did that and then you did that and then all that happened and you never let up, but then it, you know. And it, so I, I would give him the sensibility where he would make his decisions from creatively. Do you see what I mean? So that he was closer to himself as a younger, you know, cockier young film director with, with a bit of attitude which is, you see, inherent in the Mad Max films, um, then, you know, and then then he's brought all his later, more thoughtful sensibility into, then he, he's bringing that on top of the rock and roll rebel element in Fury Road. And so you have, I think, in Fury Road, overall, it's the best of the Mad Max films. Though I will say that I don't think overall we top the truck chase in number two. I do think that as pure sustained you know, harder edge, rough, uh, around the edges action. Mel Gibson's sequence in um, Road Warrior, I think it's probably the best action sequence, you know, the end truck stuff. And although it's matched with great stuff in Fury Road, but I think overall Fury Road is the better movie and works best as the best Mad Max film. So that's uh, what I think. Anyway. I saw it seven times a year it came out. Uh, four times in the theater and three times on trans, uh, trans transatlantic flights. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's one of those films that has become canon, which I'm really pleased about. It's, um, you know, I used to always read about Dan O'Bannon did Alien and, you know, all that stuff. And I, I now go, okay, well, I did, I did Mad Max Fury Road. I'm completely, that's the Brendan McCarthy Mad Max. I think they're going to make more Mad Maxes. I hope, good luck to him and I hope they're great. But that's, that's my one is Fury Road. And it is part of the canon. It's up there with, you know, Empire Strikes Back, Road Warrior, you know, first two Terminators, Matrix. You know, it's one of those. It's one of the great ones. And and it does sustain repeated viewing, you know. Jim, Jim and I have both, uh, you know, done little stuff in the in for for film like, you know, NDA shit where we have to, like, draw a ton of stuff and, and it never like we our art can't see the light of day so he's sitting on a thousand drawings i'm sitting on thousands of drawings how yeah. how much art was required like how much art did you do for mad max uh, a thousand illustrations i wouldn't say a thousand no oh, well maybe if you include storyboard frames <clears throat> but um my my time at mad max was the first six months was was brainstorming that, that was the best that was the most fun is where the film hasn't found its form. You don't know the ending or anything. And it can go anywhere. So 
I loved that period was lovely coming up the characters like like the you know the fat guy with the nose patch on that the, the business guy one of the brothers yes uh, I mean, just inventing him was hilarious. Like, I was looking at old Victorian, you know, there's uh, old pictures of um, from the 1920s of the, you know, caps list. They'd always have pinstripe suits and bags with, with dollar signs on them. You know? <laughs> so we just thought, let's just put a cat, a Wall Street capitalist in there who looks like Alfred Hitchcock, a big fat Wall Street capitalist. And except he's so corrupt that his syphilis has eroded his nose. So he's got a kind of nose piece on. And there was we, we wrote some stuff that was so perverse that we, you know, you you had to take it out. You couldn't do. It. Uh, give but us it, one example. No, I can't. I, can't, I won't. I, I had to ask. I swore, I swore I would never do it, but it was pretty disgusting stuff. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, but just coming up with that and laughing our heads off and thinking, oh, that would be great. And then coming up with. Uh, like I remember the day I do this, did this drawing on, 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 we did everything on whiteboards, these electro boards where you can print out what you draw on the board. They're a really amazing little thing. So what was really a really important thing about do writing Mad Max 2 as a Fury Road is, um, uh, that we did it more like a band making an album than we did it like writers sitting in a studio typing, you know, we didn't do it like that. We were up standing and we'd write the dialogue on the board. I'd do maybe a, a couple of drawings as to what the vehicle looked like. So it's okay. Well, if there's somebody standing at the front there, it's going to need a rail around the front. Okay. And we can use that rail for him to hook his thing around. Do you know what I mean? So yes. the design and the scripting was going on like that all the time. <clears throat> and we were doing it on our feet. We'd be sitting around and then we'd be up. Oh, hang on a minute. What about that? And and then I'd sit down and George would come up and finish off the bit and add a bit of dialogue and wham, suddenly a scene's really rocking now, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what I liked about it. I think that he um, <clears throat> he was smart enough to curtail his writing process, which might have been a bit more formal for things like Lorenzo's Oil, because he wrote it with a theatre screenwriter, uh, a theatre writer, playwright. And um, uh, with me, he was thinking, OK, this guy's going to be anarchic and you know, nutty and and the other underground comic guys is a nut anyway. So I'm just going to let, I'm going to be nutty for six months. And I guess he enjoyed that side of him coming out. And we were up and down all the time. And I feel that that sort of more rock and roll attitude to writing a film and having a who gives a fuck feeling about the movie is in the spirit of the film when you see it. I think it's there, you know. It's so visual, and uh, after I saw it, it kind of made me reassess a lot of action movies from the last 15 years or so, and, and I was very disappointed in comparison, you know, like a lot of these other action movies just didn't hold up, and I, I'm sure that comes from writing it in such a visual process, you know, if you're writing it in storyboards and you're sharing these drawings and everybody's going back and forth with them, I would assume that's a, part, a major reason why that film is so visual, you know, why that action is so visceral on screen, because... I mean, if you write it that way, that's the whole conception. You know, I, I would assume that informed exactly. all of it from the beginning. Um, Brandon, yeah. you you know, you described you've described several high quality collaborations here today. Carol Swain, Peter Milligan, George Miller, Peter Pound. Um, so much of comics is collaborative. I wonder if you have any advice or suggestions or observations of what makes a good collaboration. What can we take out of this and apply to our own work and in collaborative interaction? <clears throat> Um, well, the industry has changed a lot where you've now got, basically it's a writer's industry and, uh, artists are second fiddle to writers now, which I find, um, one of the things that I find, uh, there's a sameness and a boringness to comics for me these days is that they're all writer led. Therefore it tends to, towards literariness, which bores me. I'm not interested in literariness, um, you know, I'm a visual artist and I, I went through the process of fine art training and studying all that stuff so i come out of a world where the visual artist is the intellectual and creative easily equivalent of the writer you don't say for example that james joyce is the greater artist than pablo picasso or you know shakespeare's greater than michelangelo you know i mean they're both at high levels of genius and um what i find about um comics at the moment is <clears throat> it's very hard to find a writer who's open to 
like collaborating in a genuinely open way. I've been lucky with Pete Milligan. That was a period of our lives where we were both, you know, starting out. We didn't know anything about it. it wasn't too much ego involved. We didn't have anything to lose and lots to gain. And uh, we, you know, and Pete wasn't particularly a comic book guy, but he was bringing in a very wicked sophistication about literature. So what was great about working with Pete is that Peter didn't. Um, Peter didn't venerate high high literature. Like it wasn't, you know, there was there was that horrible trend for a while where people were dropping references to Shakespeare into their comics, so that librarians would approve of them and select their graphic novel for stocking in the libraries. Um, that kind of gentrification, where the middle class tell you what's okay and what's not, um, I despise that. I really hate it, and uh, um, so. There's that tendency in comics now, uh, you know, to sort of, um, to literariness and writeriness and, you know, and, I, and it doesn't interest me at all. I'm more interested in life. It must be about life to me rather than, let's do a comic about a writer writing a comic about, you know, that sort of meta type shit. I mean, look, when you're young and 21, putting yourself in the comic and commenting on your character's fate like as me and Pete Milligan did in, you know, Freak Wave about 300 years ago. That's a big move when you think you're very postmodern and smart. But everybody does it. You know, it's this phase you go through. Um, uh, so um, when you talk about collaboration, I mean, I'd like to work with some, there's some writers I think, oh, this guy's got some something going for him. It's whether or not they're going to have, they can put their ego down enough to go, I'm open to your ideas and I'm, I'm going to be open to them. But I don't want to end up, see, I don't want to end up in a position where I'm just illustrating somebody's script. That's boring to me because I've got to be able to put my stuff into it. It's like, look what Jack Kirby did for Stan Lee. I mean, it took us age, it, it, it took us quite a while as an industry to work out what Jack Kirby actually contributed to Marvel and the big difference when he stopped. Where are all the great Marvel characters since? You know, there's a few here and there, you get one. But really, Kirby, the phenomenal... And also, I don't want to diminish Stan Lee. I'm not in that Stan versus Jack stuff. I think together they were Lennon and McCartney, both great. And plus he had Ditko as well. So how lucky was Stan Lee? But they were all lucky, all of them, to hit that moment at that time. So I, I, I really enjoy collaborating uh, creatively with people. I think you get what Burroughs called the third mind. Um, you know, the thing that you'd get if you on your own, you didn't get it. I mean... As I say, I was a kid in the 60s, so I was completely steep, uh, steeped in the Beatles and that whole 60s, you know, then the collaboration of Lennon and McCartney uh, in music, again, produced something greater than the two of them together. And um, I felt that with Pete Milligan, there was a charisma, a, a, a simpatico for us, which uh, I haven't had since in comics. Um, I had a quite a good time with Al Ewing. He was fun. He's got a sense of humour, although I hope he keeps his sense of humour. And because um, that was his, I thought it, one of his strong points was that his work had a, I like anarchic black humour, which is why I like the Mad Max films. There was a lot of, I mean, think of Thunderdome. Although it wasn't a successful uh, Mad Max movie, I like the fact that everybody in the film is fighting over shit. They're actually <laughs> fighting. They're fighting over pig shit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, when I, I met George, I said that to him. That's what I loved about him. That, that there's that dark black humour underneath it all. And he said, look at these people. Even after the world's been completely destroyed, they're still fighting this time over shit. You know, because it makes me think. But, you know, I mean, but that's, as a metaphor, was fabulous. So, yeah, there's lots of, uh, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't say there's lots of creators about. Uh, but there are some creators about that interest me a lot who I'd like to work with. Yeah, I mean, you know. The, the, you know, and there's um, a couple of, I did have a couple of collaborations that nearly happened. Um, nearly did something with Grant Morrison once. Uh, what happened? Something happened to that. It was a Doom Patrol he uh, wrote for me. And um, I think a film came up suddenly and I had to do it because I had to have the money. And I, you know, apologised to Grant and had to not do it. But um, uh, I, I really, that's it really. I don't think I've ever worked with uh, any many other people. I mean, if I do work for hard stuff, I mean, that's fine. Then I'm doing it. You know, I did a Dr. Fate for DC. Again, they, they phoned me up when Dan Dedeo phoned me up and said, listen, we got a Dr. Fate strip. It's a two-parter and the series is cancelled after that. 
Paul Levitz wants to do a, a big freak out psychedelic strip. And I thought, Paul Levitz, you know, <laughs> probably was quite a straight laced guy. So uh, I said, all right, yeah, why not? So I got this script from Paul Levitz and it was just, I thought, okay, I'll give this pretty mad script and just give it a good old try, you know, and I don't, that was a lot of fun because in a way it takes the pressure off me. I can just do, it's like playing as a session musician or somebody else's thing, like doing a good riff underneath a song, you know. So that was, it's, there's some good bits in uh, Dr. Fate. Not all, not all of it I was happy with. The early stuff I wasn't happy with. But once I get, it got into the groove, then it started to rock and there were some very good pages in uh, Dr. Fate. And it was coloured by a guy called Mark Harrison. And I saw I saw his work and asked him, would you mind colouring this? And I, he draws, he's a comic book artist himself. But he uh, he coloured it and he did a knockout job. And also when I'm working with a colourist, I also cut out all the rendering and stuff because I want them to, I want the colourist to shine and do their trip rather than me doing loads of rendering and they're just putting in pastel colours so you can see the rendering. So I cut all the rendering out, almost did outlines with bits of black. And then he had lots of space to drop colour effects and nice things in there, you know? One final question I have, just uh, regarding the color in, in your later period comic books. Um, yeah. You know, we, we know your work so much, like, the, the color sticks in our mind. Um, the decision to use a colorist, is it a time issue, or uh, you just want to, it's part of the collaboration? Part of the yeah. idea to collaborate? So, look, it, my decision to come back into comics is I thought, if I come back into comics this time, I'm not just going to I can't, I'm not going to go and live in poverty to, like a monk doing comics. That's done. I, I had that period of my life. And, sure. you know, I gave my best creative years, if you like, to comics. So I've made my statement in comics, whatever that is now. Um, I'm not saying, you know, the stuff I'm doing now isn't fun. or But it's a bit, it's a bit more, I'm a bit more lighthearted and easy about how I'm doing comics now. So uh, in order to make it work for me, I, I thought, I'm going to try, I wanted to do the Zorza Zil. I started off colouring, I, I set the style of, the, often what I'll do is I'll colour the first one or two episodes to set the style and then bring in a colourist and they can just copy it as best as they can. And when the work comes back to me, before it goes to the editor, I then manipulate their work to pull it more into style and drop pop video, you know, types of effects. See, if you notice in a lot of my strips, I tend to use the gutters with color and design patterns and stuff around the comic book panels. Uh, as, uh, some, you know, sometimes I'll, I'm doing a strip at the moment where I'm going to leave them white as usual, it's just going to leave the cutters white. But uh, sometimes I feel like I just want to, I want the gutters to work as kind of like incidental music, as in a film, you know, where you get mood music to, to heighten the atmosphere you're trying to create. That's what I'm doing with the gutter stuff in, in the designs and, and rhythms in the, in the pat and the patterns in in those gutters around the comic book panels, is to accentuate the mood what, of what's happening in the action in the page, and I like sometimes just to see the page as a like a canvas, just that exists on its own as a unit. So it's part of an ongoing narrative, but it exists as well as a as a page. So um, yeah, I mean that's a strategic decision. I, I'm kind of interested in see also collaboration. Just what what does it look like if I get that person to color it? And I, I'm seeing colorists. Like I noticed that Silver Surfer color. You know that who's that guy? Trad Moore. Yeah, that's good. That's that's pretty good. I thought. Yeah. And uh, Day, uh, who's it's um, you know uh, Michael Aldred. He's uh, his uh, wife. Is it Laura? Laura. Yes. Old? She's. Um, rocking out a bit on X-Ray Robot, I've noticed. And, you know, that's starting to... i have starting to notice that the artists are starting to twig the colourists and not giving it to the colourist as the afterthought, but thinking, I've got to draw this for the colourist so that they really pop. You know, that that's that's been a, quite a change in my stuff recently when I'm doing it for a colourist. I actually, just as writers sometimes write for the artist, I'm also drawing for the colourist, you know, just to... Uh, let them shine and do things that I haven't seen before because there's things you can do in colour now with Photoshop and stuff. You know, we, we couldn't do them before. I want to see that stuff, you know. Um, also, I, I would say just um, one of the big things for me all through my art, my career as an artist has been that I'm basically a fine artist in terms of my, you know, sensibilities and things I'm interested in. 
and I apply those things into comics. And so now and then I have to have I have to go on a kind of artistic walkabout and just paint and collage and draw for a month or two, nothing to do with comics. But invariably, something I might stumble across in, you know, just very free-flowing art stuff, I'll think, oh, that's really interesting. I haven't tried that before. And then I'll build it up, you know, um, in in the fine art sort of context. But then I'll import it back into comics. So when, um, when I lived in Australia doing Mad Max, I particularly got heavily in, interested in Aboriginal painting, which is phenomenal painting. The new painting coming out of the Aboriginal communities in in the deserts of Australia is for, look, lots of it is crap, but the good stuff is some of the best fine art being done in the world. And um, these canvases by these Australian Aborigines are stunning to me. And uh, I've I've been really imbibing the feeling and the the the, the, the colour sensuality of their stuff, and um, recreating it digitally. And starting to use, you know, by using sort of uh, tone on, uh, um, you know, I might airbrush a load of space on Photoshop and then use a curves tool to, you know, solarize it. And then I might airbrush more stuff on top and gradually it turns into something. And I keep putting it through saturation, changing the colors, take it back into curves, mix it a bit more. And gradually it becomes an abstract and then I think, oh, this is quite nice here, but there's a sort of an Aboriginal influence in there somewhere. Not, it's not specific, but it's the feeling. And then I brought that into a strip I did, which was set in Australia uh, a couple of years ago called Chopper, which is about a flying surfer. It's in the Judge Dredd world. That was a, a story I invented, went to 2000 AD with it, who, who were looking for a Chopper story. I said, what about this? And, I'll, and uh, it worked. there's some really beautiful stuff in it. And that was one where I started off colouring it and then I gave the rest of the strip to Len O'Grady, uh, the colourist, who did a fantastic job and he brought his, once I briefed him on it and got him to look at Aboriginal stuff and other colourists as well, um, he did his thing and then it came back to me for a final production pass where I could then really remix some of the colours, drop some, you know, pattern work behind panels and stuff to, to really pop them out of the page. There was a, there was that, um, for example, there was a comic strip I did, just a very, it was a very off, oddball strip I did with Pete Milligan called The Hollow Circus. It was a black and white photo montage thing in AI or A1, I think it was called. I don't know, if you, I, think you, I think you covered it a bit in... Um, yes. Yeah. Well, that was interesting because Pete, I said to Pete, Pete, I've got a bit of, I've got sort of like a month or so. Have you got any piece of have you got a piece of writing that I could work with and just I want to do something with a piece of your writing? So he gave me this piece of writing which was the Hollow Circus. So I christened it. He just gave me the writing, so I christened it the Hollow Circus. And then I started to break it into panels of little bits of writing. And I laid it out over some pages, just roughly and then I started to photocopy random things like old bibles and bits of things you know that were around the place and um when i settled down to do it i started to play all this continually you know how soon is now by the smiths that that incredibly howling guitar sound in the thing yes um i wanted i think i'm just going to play that all the time until i get that that feeling that it creates in me i get it out in the art you know, so I, so I'm trying to fuse how soon is now that wailing guitar, you know, throbbing mind kind of craziness in that song into that strip. Uh, and that's sort of what I mean about fusing different things where I'm prepared to absolutely let a song dominate my sensibility to the point where it possesses me and then work from a kind of method acting way of working. Do you see what I mean? Where I become outside of my normal sphere, I go into the thing created by the music. So that's sort of, that's where I, I like to uh, create stuff to make things have a different feel to each other, is to go into feelings quite a lot and then create out of that space. In, Brendan, we, we took two hours of your time. Jim, do you have any final or should we get out? Because <laughs> I have one, I have one quick final. Um, any plans to reprint Swim Any Purpose? 
yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I did speak to a publisher, but um, here's the, the here's what I want to do is for me purpose. I would like to reprint it and put it out properly because, again, like all my other stuff, it came out and was promptly ignored. And I just thought, well, this is, I think, one of the best artists, you know, books of their own work that I've seen. That I've seen, I've seen about. If I put it next to, I don't know how many people have done that before. But it's not really like one of those, you know, the art of Mike Mignola, say, and then you, it's not like one of those books at all. It's a personal account of my work by me with a little commentary that runs through it. And um, it's very Id idiosyncratic and it's a work of art unto itself. And what I used as my brief when I constructed the book, it's 250 pages. And I just wanted you to start at the beginning and then just go through it. And most of it is a sensual visual experience. So I constructed it a bit like the Beatles' White Album. I don't know if you know that or not. I, I, I'm oh, referencing the Beatles today. Okay. The Beatles' White Album is a kind of potpourri of different types of styles. And it starts off a sort of quite disciplined. You get a sort of sense of a running order and it goes into this and it goes into that. And, but as it goes on, it starts to get a bit more kind of chaotic. And by the time you're hitting the fourth side and it's revolution and you're going into crime – Cry Baby Cry, uh, Revolution, what was it, um, Helter Skelter, and then uh, Revolution Number 9. You, you've gone into complete abstraction. Uh, so I wanted to do a book that starts off, it's quite chronological kind of to start with. It gives you a sense of who I am, where I was born. These are the kinds of things I liked when I was young. This is what was happening in the culture. And this, is the, this is when I met Brett Ewins, and this is when I developed my comic book kind of characters, and here's early art school work, and here's this art led to that character, and then we got a break, and then I did, you know, my first work in America, going to Hollywood, blah, 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 all that. But as it goes on, it starts to just let the art take over, and then it's just pages of uncommented upon images. And then as towards the end, it pulls itself back together again into a conclusion so that you feel like you've gone through something. So it goes from a kind of ordered art of Brendan McCarthy type book into just James Joyce, Ulysses, randomness, and then comes back at the end to a focus. So that was the structure of the book. Now, I think it's a really interesting book. I did tons of stuff on it. Again, as usual, it came out nothing. And uh, it sold out. Everybody's, you know, you can, you can pick them up for about... Um, you can pick them up for about 150 or so, I think, on eBay now and then one comes up. But I do want to get it done. The only thing publishers are doing these days is they say, okay, we're, we would be interested in it, but you have to do all the clearances. So publishers used to clear the, the images, you know, with the copyright holders. Now they make you do it. So I'm just thinking, Christ, do I really want to phone up all these film companies? And, you know, all that side of it's put me off. So if I do it as an academic work, small print, small pr press run, I can then claim, um, what's it called, uh, uh, fair use. If it's an academic work of my work, it's not a commercial piece, I can claim fair use and not have to go through all that nightmare of clearances. So unless I get a very good publisher who's reputable enough to do the clearances, most comic book publishers don't have staff equipped to do clearances and they don't know how to do it. So they just say, oh, you've got to do all that. So that's put me off. You've got to understand, again, so many purposes will be a lot of work for no money because it will come out, it won't sell. People say it's brilliant, nobody buys it, and he's a great cult. <laughs> what would be required is uh, you put that out, you have to come talk to us again, and we will give our robust audience the marching orders to scoop that thing up. We'll make you some money, man. Look, listen, this is the very first time I've ever spoken publicly about my work. Um, uh, you know, like this, on a, on, where there's a record of it. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, and maybe, you know, further down the line, if, if indeed, uh, that is my on my bucket list, is to reprint so many purpose. I'd actually add, I'd want to add about 50 new pages, because I've got tons of stuff in it, like new stuff, Mad Max and all the stuff that I didn't put in the first one. And... Um, you know, I think it could be a nice 300-page summation of my work and what I spent my time on this planet doing, which was, weirdly enough, creating obscure comic books for about seven people to read. Where can 
our audience uh, find you online? Uh, well, any, uh, any links you want to drop? I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm also, uh, I have a website which I don't maintain. I, I, I thought I'd better do something when the Mad Max film came out, just in case people came looking to offer me work or something, you know. So I put something up with my with some of my work on it and some contact information. Uh, that's about it, really. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't live online or anything. Sure. What's your Twitter handle? I'll put the link in the description of the video okay. below. Uh, is it at Mystic McCarthy? Brendan. Can we do it again sometime? I'm flying high after this conversation, and I feel very, very, very inspired. Well, listen, I, I was thinking of you guys uh, yesterday, and in digging through some boxes, I found um, it might be a bit dog-eared, but I found a copy of So Many Purpose. I've got a few myself for my own collection, obviously, to both versions. But I, maybe I'll, 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 as a, I'll send it to you as a, just as a gift if you want to you know, see it. Sounds I good. Mean, it, it might be the end of the channel because we'll, we will fight for it. <laughs> But uh, we, yeah, I've only we would got love one, to see it. It's, be it really. it's my kind of, if I show it to somebody, I show them that copy, you know, so I've, I've got a couple of pristine ones. And then my, uh, I was going to say, you might guys like, like to see it because a lot of stuff in it that it's only in Swim Your Purpose. You won't have seen it anywhere else. We would definitely have to do yes. a video. I think, I think we're good to go. Brendan, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. You're very generous. And uh, we definitely have some great food for thought. Uh, I'm going to be editing this in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And Chop out. <laughs> there's going to be so many more questions I'm going to have. So hopefully we could get together again uh, soon, do this all yeah. over again and, and uh, expand on some, some of the ideas we lay down here today. Yeah. And good luck with the channel, by the way. I think you're doing a great job. You're the, I think you're the, 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 the credible comic book podcast these days. Thanks, thanks a lot for that street cred, man. Yeah, thanks so much, Brandon.